Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to bring today Store Magic in our Citrix Ready Technical Webinar Series. We have a very insightful topic to discuss today: uh, running Citrix workloads at the edge with Store Magic. And we have two wonderful speakers today: Lee Bushin, Partner Enablement Manager from Store Magic, and our very own Chris Edwards. He's the Senior Manager of Product Marketing at Citrix. Before we move on, I'd like to take you through a little bit of housekeeping details. Uh, before that, let me quickly introduce what Citrix Ready is. Uh, as you may have attended, some of you may have attended some other Citrix Ready technical webinar series. Citrix Ready is basically a platform that we provide Citrix customers as a single number one source to evaluate verified products which are Citrix compatible. Um, we try and provide you trusted technologies that have assured compatibility with our products. So we've sort of created this platform yeah, we partner with technology companies uh, to bring joint solutions to life for our customers. We have a couple of links displayed on this uh, slide in case you want to visit our marketplace. This is where all our compatible partner technologies are listed. In case you're interested in learning a little bit more about the program, there's another URL mentioned there. Uh, before we move on, let me now quickly walk you through a few housekeeping details. So the audio for this webinar uh, is available on VoIP as well as on phone call. So I've displayed a couple of screenshots on the screen in case you're having a problem figuring out uh, the UI. Uh, there's also a question and answer panel here. So in case you have any questions during the webinar, please do ask them. Uh, we have Mike, uh, a gentleman from Store Magic, and myself from Citrix would be answering these questions on the chat itself. We also have a formal Q&A session in the end. Uh, so if you have any questions uh, there, please do ask as well. We will be recording the webinar and a link will be sent out to you within 24 hours uh, from when we conclude the webinar. There are also some phone numbers listed here in case you want to dial in uh, using your phone. Next slide, please. Uh, so before we begin, uh, let me bring on Chris. Hi, Chris. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Chris Edwards. I'm in product marketing for Citrix virtual apps and desktops. And my background is mostly in IT across consulting and enterprise IT. Thank you, Chris, and thanks for joining the webinar. And Lee, who's also an ex Citrite, uh, now works with Store Magic and uh, has some pretty insightful uh, things to talk about in this webinar. Lee, you wanna quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, Rubel. Hi, Chris. Uh, so, I'm, yes, I'm Lee Bush and Partner Enablement Manager for Store Magic. Um, I previously spent 10 years working for Citrix and running a number of webinars for them. So, I'm really, really looking forward to, to talking to the Citrix audience again about Store Magic. Thank you, Lee, and appreciate you joining the webinar and speaking to our audience. Um, I guess over to you now. Okay, brilliant. Well, well, thanks very much for uh, for that introduction. I just want to also introduce um, my main man, Mark Christie, as well. Um, all the way through this webinar today, you get the option via the questions window to ask any question of us that you that you would like. Okay, and Mark is uh, what he doesn't know about SV San and Store Magic isn't worth knowing. So, Mark, um, just say hello to everyone. Hi, everybody. Pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, so get those questions out to Mark. If you want to follow the Q&A, he'll be answering the questions back to all users so you can follow the Q&A as you go through. Um, if we have some good questions, we might actually pick them out for during the webinar and share them live as well. So great to have you with us here today, Mark. And uh, so let's let's move on to uh, to the agenda now. And I think, uh, Chris, you, you, you're going to do the agenda for today, right? Sure, thanks, Lee. Yep, so um, I'll quickly go through the agenda. Uh, we'll give an intro of Store Magic. We'll discuss some of the challenges for small and medium enterprises, and we'll cover what Store Magic SVSAN is and how it works. And then we'll give it an overview of Citrix Cloud and how we're integrating with Store Magic SVSAN. And then Lee will actually walk us through a demo of Citrix Cloud on Store Magic. And then we'll review who is using Store Magic, wrap up with a summary, and then Lee has a prize to announce. Yeah, exactly. So, so we've got the uh, uh, pocket drone actually for uh, for, um, for for a giveaway. We're going to leave that to the last minute to make sure you guys stay on till the bitter end. Okay, we we should be running just slightly over one hour. So hopefully you can join us for the overall webinar. You'll be uh, using the questions window to answer a question, a really simple question. The first one to get the answer 
will actually will actually win the drone. So good luck to you all today. So so thanks very much, Chris, for uh, introducing the agenda. So let's let's get going. Um, let's talk a little bit about the first section here that we want to talk about and some of the challenges for for virtualization. So really, there are, there are two main areas um, I feel that that people are, are having issues with virtualization. And you know, the first the first area is for small data center. Okay, so these are small organizations that maybe want to have the dream of having their users work from anywhere, any place, on any device. You know, the, the standard Citrix dream. But really, you know, they're worried about data leakage. They're worried about data on laptops, data on PDAs, and you know. All that kind of thing. So what they want to do is make sure all that data still stays centrally in the data center, but it's accessed remotely via a virtual desktop environment. Okay, so that it's for for small data centers and small to medium sized enterprises. Now, just because we talk about small data centers doesn't necessarily mean they have to be small customers. What it could be is a large organization that wants to deploy virtualization at a tactical level. So maybe for a project that they, they need to spin up, you know, 500 desktops in a call center or something. Uh, maybe it's on a departmental level. Maybe it's an um, M&A, something of, of that nature that they just want to get things up and running really quickly. So that's one of the areas that, that we can really help out here. Now, one of the key things for, for any organization that's relying on virtual desktop infrastructure is reliability of that the infrastructure. And, you know, that's great. And the hypervisors today have very good resilience built into them. You can use things like, you know, load balancing, uh, DRS type technologies to, to balance the load. You can use HA technology. So if you have a hardware failure, um, servers will restart on one of the surviving nodes, but it comes at a cost. So for virtual desktop infrastructures, we tend to find that at least 50% of the overall capital expenditure is for a SAN, okay, to facilitate some of these HA technologies, okay. That's also a single point of failure. So we want to get around that and we really want to help you to get a highly resilient system, but without having a single point of failure or some sort of massive cost associated with it. So, you know, you've got the cost side of things. Another thing that's really, really important is user experience as well. So if virtual desktops aren't accepted by users that are out there, so they're not at least as good, if not better than um, some of the, uh, you know, a, a local experience, then they're really not going to accept that at all. So what we make sure with the Store Magic solution is that we have all sorts of great caching technology in there to make sure the user experience is extremely snappy. And you know we're going to be showing you some demos later on, and we've got some some demos, some some load testing that we've done as well, and we're sharing all the results of those um, as we go forward. I read the last thing for small data center or small project base is really the solution complexity. So you know not only do you have to buy a SAN, hook that up to your hypervisors, have to manage that whole SAN. Um, but also it's the whole infrastructure of virtual desktops itself. So you know you've got brokers, you've got storefronts, you've got license servers, all of that complexity really doesn't make sense to do that for such a small project. You know, it's fine if you're, you know, consolidating 10,000 users down to a main data center, you've got the economies of scale there, but for a small business, solution complexity is a, is a big headache. And that's really where Citrix Cloud can help you. And you'll see through this webinar that Citrix Cloud really does take away a lot of that administrative overhead from the virtual desktop solution. So really that small data center, the next area that I, I think is really key for the Store Magic and Citrix solution is organizations that have lots of branch offices. So they're big organizations, but they're highly distributed. Okay. So some of the organizations out there, we have what manufacturing plants, we have um, you know, retail outlets, we have coffee shops, you know, hundreds and hundreds of different locations. Um, you know, all of that side that we have ships. So imagine, imagine we, we actually do a, a solution for a, a cruise line and their branch offices are actually ships, right? So they need to have really resilient infrastructure in, in there. But also another thing that's really starting with the whole advent of, of things like Internet of Things is that a lot of these systems at these branch offices are generating huge volumes of data in telemetry, that kind of thing, and really Centralizing it back to a data center just isn't an option. They need to have their applications, they need to have their analysis done locally uh, on those, on those, uh, at those branch offices. 
Now, obviously, WAN speed can be an issue. So, you know, if you're going to give the user that snappy desktop experience, if he's sitting on a cruise ship and accessing over a satellite, um, some sort of data center application, it, it's got latency involved here. It's, got, it's not going to be giving him the snappy performance, even if you do use all of the HDX um, protocols to, to optimize that as much as possible. And also WAN resilience. So say you're a coffee shop. And you, uh, or, or some sort of uh, bakery, or I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm dropping a few different use cases that I know at the moment. But say your till system goes down, what are you going to do? Well, you, you can't transact your business, right? What if your manufacturing plant goes down? You, you can't have a virtual desktop solution that that dies when the WAN goes down. Which means that that users need to have um, these resources locally in these edge locations or these uh, remote office, branch office locations, and centralization isn't really an option for them. But guess what? Even if you do move those virtual desktops right down to the branch office and have the servers running there, you still end up with the same problem that the SMEs have, which is reliability. How are you going to provide highly available infrastructure that if a server dies or if power supply dies in a machine or network card, it's not going to affect your business. So that's still an issue, even if you're in a branch office. Now, one thing about branch offices that is really, you know, more important maybe than a centralized data center deployment is security. A lot of these branch offices have servers that sit underneath people's desks or in a storeroom or something like that. So that the concept of someone coming along and actually stealing the server itself or the disk from within it is, is a reality. It's not like they have a data center with a security yard outside and a badge system or something like that. So you know, security is something that's, that's very important for branch office solutions. So we want to make sure that the data you have isn't just encrypted in transit between Citrix Cloud and your and your user, but also it's encrypted on disk itself. OK, so we make sure with Store Magic that you have data at rest encryption in there, too. And probably the last thing that, that's important for these guys, the, the ones with lots of branch offices, is they, they want to have a distributed network, but they want to manage it centrally. So they want all of the tools that they use to be able to be pushed out from a single point and do all of that management. So, you know, with the hypervisor tools that are out there for centralized management, um, we also provide our own centralized management tools that hook into those hypervisor management tools to give you that single pane of glass into managing that infrastructure. So really, I'd just like to introduce to you the Store Magic solution. You know, what is a Store Magic solution? Well, effectively, it gets rid of the SAN gets rid of the need for a SAN. Um, it virtualizes the local storage, the local storage inside your server hosts, and creates a synchronous mirror between your two um, individual nodes. As far as the SAN, as far as the, the, the hypervisor is concerned, it's just a standard SAN. Okay. And you know, the three mottos we have is it's simple, cost effective, and flexible. We'll go into those um, in a little bit more detail in a second. So what I'd like to do now is just give you an example of how you would deploy SVSAN. It's, it's a two node setup by default. OK, you need two nodes to provide highly available um, network and uh, infrastructure for you. So you set up your two servers. So these could be two rack mounted servers, two blades. They could be a converged, hyper converged infrastructure like a Cisco um, UCS or, or um, ISR, sorry, uh, ISR type platform. Um, but effectively two individual commodity-based pieces of hardware. Okay. Now, the next thing you need in those is some disk to actually run the virtual machines on. Okay. So the great thing about SVSAN and Store Magic is that really, because of our caching technology, you don't need to go for a full flash array just to get great performance. You can actually front end some spindle disks with a um, SSD based, a flash based cache. You can even front end it with a memory cache and we'll show you, we'll drill down into some of the caching as we go through. Um, what you do need to do is just partition off part of that storage array just for local hypervisor boot and for the SVSAN um, software to actually run. So that's why I put local disk on there. Next thing you do is you put your hypervisor on there. So you run your hypervisor and install it onto that local disk. Hypervisor uh, can be VMware, can be Hyper-V. We support both those platforms in there. Okay. Once that's installed and once they're talking to the local disk, next thing we do, the next part of the puzzle, if you like, is to deploy SVSAN. Um, SVSAN runs as an appliance. It's very, very lightweight. It sits uh, physically on the hypervisor, just the same way as uh, any other 
virtual machine running in there. It can go with a minimum of one gig of RAM and one virtual CPU. So it's really, really light on resources on the server, which leaves lots of space for, for your virtual desktops. But logically, it actually sits underneath the hypervisor, and I'll explain why that is. Effectively, what SVSAN does is it exposes itself as an iSCSI target, okay? So just the same way as an iSCSI SAN would expose itself via, via a, set of, um, a set of iSCSI targets, so, so does SVSAN, okay? So in, for all intents and purposes, the hypervisor running above it thinks it's running on a SAN, okay? What's happening in the background now is the magic. So typically what we have is a set of redundant um, storage replication links and storage is, is read typically from the local node. So, you know, if you're, if you're a virtual machine that's running on say server one across here, then if you, do, if you make a read, it'll probably come out of cache, but at very worst, it'll actually come off the local spindle of that host. Writes obviously need to go to both sides of the mirror. So what we do is we write um, virtual machine writes across to both sides, one to the local storage on the local machine and also another one across this synchronous mirror. Um, typically we have like 10 gig connections between the two servers. I mean, you know, it doesn't even need that. It can actually um, be anything right down to one gig um, if need be. Um, typically, you know, if the servers sit next to each other, they, they have just have a crossover cable between them. Right, so it just takes eliminates out that single point of failure of having a um, having a switch in there. But also we have redundant links, and we use um, iSCSI uh, multi-pathing as well to allow that to happen. But here's the great thing, guys, because now both of these hypervisors and the cluster that you're managing at a hypervisor level just thinks it's talking to a SAN. What we can now do is life migrate resources across from one server to another without any downtime. We can use technology such as workload balancing, or DRS, that kind of technology. The same with Microsoft, we can use this, use all of their, their suites as well. And also if the server goes down, so if one of these nodes for whatever reason loses um, connectivity with the network or the you know, power supply blows or something, then the virtual machines that were running on it can be used using a normal HA restart policy can be launched automatically on the surviving node. So, you know, typically you could have virtual machines and virtual desktops running across both servers, but if you wanted to provide full availability, you'd have to cut your, your density in, you know, in half to, uh, to make sure that those VMs could restart on one of the surviving nodes. Okay, so that's just a quick example um, of SVSAN. Now, as I mentioned, you know, uh, you can run these servers next to each other with a crossover cable. We also support the concept of stretch clustering as well. So as long as we've got a single gigabit link, um, as long as it's got nothing more than 30 milliseconds of latency, um, you know, we can actually have two servers in completely different sites. So we've got, um, you know, I know a cruise line we were talking about, they actually have a server in the bow, don't they, Mark? They have a server in the bow and a server in the stern. So I'm not quite sure how that works with HA. If the, if the if the bow sinks, does does well, the if does the, the boat goes down, trouble <laughs> for certain. Uh, we've got uh, motorway service stations that are running this. They have um, two service stations, one on each side of the motorway carriageway, and they actually run fibre between the two underneath the motorway. So they've, we've got that sort of stretch clustering. We've even got universities that have an off-site campus, and they use it for disaster recovery. So they actually have one side of the SV Sand cluster just you know literally in in you know, about 15 kilometers away, I believe. And, and if, if the server in the main um, university goes down, it just, all the VMs just restart the other side of that link and they use some clever DNS routing to, to, to move users to the other place. So, you know, you can do stretch clustering. There's a great um, article on that down the bottom. Now, one of the things I did mention was centralized management. So just because you've got a distributed um, SAN and distributed desktop environment, you need to be able to manage it centrally. So we've got our remote witness service. Now what this remote witness service does is it keeps um, keeps order if you like. So one of the issues you have with two node clusters, and if you're a Microsoft person, you'll know this, is that if one of those nodes loses connectivity, then you can end up in this position where you have something called split brain. And what split brain is, is where both sides of the cluster think that they own the storage and they carry on writing to it. That way you get some real inconsistency between the two sides of the mirror. So in order to arbitrate and, and, and make sure that only one server is writing to the storage, you need to introduce a third element to that. 
Now, a lot of the solutions out there will require you to have that third element, that quorum disk, actually on site with that storage, which is obviously going to consume extra hardware um, for, for, for every site. But what we can do is with our remote witness, or we call it an NSH, neutral storage host, um, what that does is it can manage up to a thousand sites from one neutral storage host. OK, so again, making our technology as lean as possible. Um, we also have integrations with vCenter, so you can manage all of your remote sites uh, via vCenter or SCVMM. Um, SCVMM, by the way, you know, we've, we've actually got some integrations with the Microsoft hypervisor that, that are, are on the roadmap at the moment, so we will be providing that. Um, in terms of what I'm going to show you today, though, I'm going to show you the vCenter integration. And also we've got a web-based management tool, which I'll show you in a couple of seconds. So before we move on, probably this would be a good time for us to actually come in here and give you a quick demonstration of how easy it is to set up a store magic system. So this is my uh, this is my system here. So Mark, you've got a question. So just to uh, let everybody know, this is all actually hosted in the Innovation Center in North Carolina in the US, uh, kindly provided to us on some Lenovo hardware. This is their Lenovo Innovation Center. Um, we can actually provide sort of demo access, VPN access to these environments. So, you know, should there be some strong interest, if you'd like to run a POC uh, on this environment, mm -hmm. you know, do let us know. Uh, and absolutely, I'm sure we can uh, work with Lenovo to schedule out some time for you. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, they've been very, very good for us with this, with this load testing. They've been really very helpful. So yeah, so this is all running, as, uh, as Mark says, in the Lenovo Innovation Center. And what I've got running here is um, one, one VMware cluster that's running our launchers for a login VSI testing. We'll get to that in a second. But also we have a couple of hosts here which are running our, our overall workload. So this, this is the, 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 the appliance, if you like. This is the workspace appliance, these, these two Lenovo hosts here. Um, what we can do is, is show you how easy it is to, to actually create a storage repository or a data store. So if I go into data stores at VMware level here, you'll see there's two local data stores, which are two local disks in our host, and we've got SVSAN data store two, which is where all my virtual machines are running at the moment. But if I want to create another one, what I can do is use the store magic plugins to, to deploy that. So all I do literally is create a new shared data store within here. It'll bring up our, our little wizard. It'll go through and it'll it'll take us through this whole process. So I'm going to create a new data store. Mark, what's the first word that comes into your head? He's looking at me blankly now. Apologies, I've been asking questions. That's so, uh, a good, good man, good man. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Let's think of goatee. You've got a goatee, Mark. Sorry, sorry to sorry to do that to you, but I haven't got my goatee anymore, so I'm going to pick on you. I miss that. I prefer. I, I think you look better with it. Goatee. So I'm going to call this data store Goatee. Okay. Okay. Now we've got some spare storage left on this disk. Um, as you can see, we can use all of it. I've got 1.75 terabytes just left over um, in unpartitioned space across the two servers there. In this particular case, I'm just going to choose 100 gig just to make it quick to sync. Um, I can encrypt the drive if I'm worried about, um, you know, um, security in my remote branch office. I'm going to leave this unencrypted. Um, I can come in here and to choose which two of our SVSAN appliances are actually going to mirror this storage to. Um, I'm just going to choose the two nodes that I have, clearly. Next thing it's going to ask me is what do I want to use as my neutral storage host? So this is, as I say, this is our quorum disk that's maintaining data consistency across this two node cluster. Up to a thousand clusters can be managed by this one NSH. I've actually got one running here. Where is it running? It's running on the vSphere server, isn't it? Correct. It's actually running on the vCSA in this instance, just there as that lightweight service. Yeah, so it can run as a Windows service. It can run as a Linux service as well on, on, on Linux. So it's very lightweight. You can deploy it just once centrally. Um, there are some advanced options in here as well. So um, prefer local path. What that means is that when data gets read from disk, rather than it choosing you know, the local server or the remote server to get it from, it'll actually always choose the local server, which is preferred, right? Because it's always going to be a bit quicker if it's coming off the same motherboard. Right, so we do that. Uh, run without a neutral storage host. Well, let's not, let's not do that. Yeah, we, we, need to have, we need to have a boss in here. So let's leave that like that. Next screen, but what we can do is we can enable SSD caching to actually make our storage reads a lot quicker. Okay, um, enable memory caching as well to make it even quicker. 
So what you do typically is you just put more memory, give more memory to your VSA, your virtual storage appliance that's running on the server, and it can then consume that memory and use that for cache. Click on next. Um, which host are we going to be sharing it on? Host one and host two, clearly. It's just got to make sure that they're both authenticated. How's that looking on the screen, by the way? Can you actually see all of this? You can, good. Okay. And that's a real finished. sort of key point there as to which hosts you're actually sharing this to. I mean, in, in this architecture, we're trying to demonstrate this sort of two node lean high availability scenario. Uh, but what we'll be talking about later on is perhaps some of those customers that are then actually sharing this storage externally as that SAM based storage sure, to, sure. to these you know, dedicated compute VDI servers as well. Okay, yeah, well, and we'll, we'll talk about that um, as we go through. So I'm just going to hit finish here. And what this is now going to do is it's going to create on VMware that data store. So it's going to, it's going to create it on SVSAN, that particular data store. It's then going to rescan the storage to make sure that, that VMware can see those at an iSCSI level. It's then going to squirt down a VMFS data store over the top of that so that we can launch and run virtual machines in there. And you know, very, very quickly, it's going to have that up and running. Now, one thing you can do is you can go through to manage VSAs here. And this, what this will do is it will give you a little link to the, um, to the VSAs themselves. So if I click on VSA1, for instance, it'll give you the web link that goes to the management, um, management UI. Okay, so I'll click on there. And this will take me into the, the storage appliance that's actually running. So you'll see there's a warning there. Mark, there's a warning. What's going on? I'll tell you what's going on. We're going to targets and have a look and show you that target, that iSCSI target, M0 GOATI, has now been created. But you'll see it's still resynchronizing. So what it does is it sets one as being the master, or sets one as you know being the, the main part of the data store. And it's now synchronizing between those two servers to make sure that data is consistent between them. Um, if we now go into data stores at a VMware level, you'll see we've got that GOATI store that's now available for uh, virtual machines to run on it. If we go into the host itself, okay, and uh, look down at, uh, where is it, under data stores? Yeah, actually, no, it's, uh, it's under configure. So if we go into, yeah, of course it can see it there, but if we go into configure, we can actually see a little bit more information as well. So if we go to storage devices, you'll actually see in here that data store, but more importantly, you'll see what it looks like at an iSCSI level. So there's the 100 gig um, store magic, and there's the four paths. So it's actually making sure that not only do we have redundancy between two servers, but there's redundancy on the network as well. Um, so if one of those NICs gets pulled, we'll still have replication, we'll still have a highly consistent um, storage replica in there. Okay, so Literally, just uh, go through to VSA1, you can see it's synchronized. So we're now up and running, we can get virtual machines going, no problem at all. So, why store magic for Citrix? Well, I said we had three, three different uh, watchwords, if you like, simple and powerful, so it's low complexity. I mean, with that, that UI, you saw how quick it was to set up some storage. You can, you can actually deploy the VSA appliances down to those servers from that GUI as well, just by clicking a few buttons, it'll actually install those VSAs down there. You can patch them, um, you can upgrade them as well, all without taking any of that storage offline or any of those services offline either. Um, you can deploy in minutes, we've got the caching in there to give you the performance that you need for, for those edge locations. And of course, all of this is certified as a Citrix ready and it's certified by ourselves, this one particularly by Lenovo, but we also have Citrix certification and Citrix. So, you know, whoever you need to talk to to, to solve any any support um, incidents that come up, you know, we've, we've got it sorted at the back end. Second one is uh, cost effective. So, as, you, as I said, very, very lightweight footprint on the server. Uh, we've got a highly efficient witness service or quorum disk uh, or quorum service that can sit centrally and manage up to a thousand clusters. So we don't need to do that on every single site. Um, we've got data encryption to allow you to uh, have secure environments at branch offices and really giving you the lowest cost of per desktop. Um, also, high level of flexibility in there as well. So um, hardware agnostic. So, you know, really the only prerequisite we have is that the hardware that you're using is supported by VMware or Hyper-V, right, which is pretty much any server class hardware out there, right? 
So it's scale independent as well. You can actually scale this out in many different ways, which we'll talk about uh, towards the end. But you know, it's not just a two node solution. We can actually make it um, scale based on, on your needs as well. And you, know, you can run it in two different modes. You can run it as a hyper-converged infrastructure by virtualizing the storage layer, or you can run it, uh, run it, run it as a standard um, server-based SAN. So you can actually just have SV SAN running like a SAN. It's, we call it a server SAN, but it's effectively not running workloads on, on the SV SAN cluster, just the storage itself. Okay? So that's the, uh, that's the watchwords, if you like. So what I'd like to do now is move across to back to Chris Edwards. And, and Chris, you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how Citrix Cloud helps some of these issues and some of these, um, these concerns that small enterprises and highly distributed enterprises have. Awesome. Yeah, thankfully, that was a, a fantastic uh, intro overview and, and an awesome demo. Um, so let's now talk about how Citrix Cloud and StoreMagic integrate together. So first of all, what is Citrix Cloud? And I think most people are up to speed on what Citrix Cloud is and what it does. But for those of you that are new to Citrix, what we did is we took a lot of our existing on-prem traditional solutions such as virtual apps and desktops and endpoint management, which was formerly named Zen App and Zen Desktop and, and Zen Mobile, because um, we just went through a name change. And we enabled these as cloud services, making them much easier to consume. And not only did we make them cloud, cloud services, but we added additional capabilities and additional services that really complete the full workspace picture with virtual apps and desktops, endpoint management, content collaboration, networking and analytics, so the end result is that all of your employees have everything that they need to do their jobs, their apps, their, their desktops and data from any device while we have enabled uh, you guys in IT to make it simpler and easier to deploy these solutions for your organization. Um, and we have a customer expert open discussion later this month with a customer that had a zero, they had zero Citrix footprint and zero Citrix experience and they went through a complete digital transformation with Citrix Cloud. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Lee. And uh, I wanna take a quick, quick moment here to discuss the value of the, the Citrix virtual apps and desktops, uh, formerly Zen app and Zen desktop, and what this really empowers for your organization. So if, if you think about centralizing your apps and desktop in your data center, and then providing secure remote access you know, what does that enable for your business? So it enables your employees to access their apps and data from any device, which enables you guys in IT to embrace low cost endpoints or even BYOD, which can reduce cost and even more importantly, uh, reduce the management footprint and the headache of managing those devices. And this enables employees to work from anywhere, which can improve employees' uh, work-life balance. I know it sounds pretty cheesy when somebody in marketing says this, but I actually had a customer tell me that um, Citrix virtual apps and desktops really improved their employees' uh, quality of life. Um, and a lot of companies are adopting flex spaces or flex time for their employees, which can save a ton of money on real estate and operational costs, um, while at the same time improving employee satisfaction. And then this can also help accelerate mergers and acquisitions on the front end the same way it helps accelerating the onboarding of new employees. Um, and it's also helped you to uh, hire remote employees or seamlessly expand regionally or globally. When you, know, when you go to bring on a new location, all you need is an internet connection and some low cost endpoints. And this is all while providing the best possible user experience uh, to your employees for their ac access to their uh, virtual apps and desktop to their Citrix workspace. So we can go ahead to the next slide. When, um, when talking to a lot of uh, customers, you know, everybody has their own unique strategy and their own unique approach to, to cloud. And uh, we hear from a lot of customers that while they want to start adopting cloud services, they have this sort of a hybrid approach where they want to keep some or most of their workloads on-prem in their data center behind their security layers. And you know they want to overcome those IT constraints, whether that's headcount, budget, limited skill set, with a solution that they can get up and running with as quickly as possible 
and while you know minimizing the ongoing operational overhead. So next slide. So what we did is we partnered with Store Magic to make it even easier to get up and running with Citrix Cloud with the virtual apps and desktop service with automated integration of the Citrix Cloud connectors. So this gives you the reassurance when making a buying decision that the solution is fully integrated and fully supported from cloud service to your on-prem infrastructure in your data center on your Store Magic architecture. So, and Lee will give a more technical dive into deploying Citrix Cloud on Store Magic. Um, but uh, Lee, go to the next slide. Um, here, I want to just give a high-level um, overview to, to touch on the benefits. So, combining Citrix Cloud and, and Store Magic, there really are some some synergies and benefits. It's an incredibly simple solution. You get the simplicity of Citrix Cloud and the simplicity of Store Magic, plus the automated integration. So the solution is easy to, to deploy and it reduces the uh, ongoing maintenance. And it's a very scalable solution. You get the scale as you grow architecture from Store Magic, And with the, the Citrix Cloud, the infrastructure components are managed for you. So it's very seamless to spin up more virtual desktops and virtual app servers. And it's also secure. So this is an important thing to note on the Citrix Cloud front. The user credentials are encrypted. So Citrix Cloud only handles the metadata required for brokering the services. It doesn't have access to your apps uh, or data. Those are in your control, behind your security layers, in your data center, on your StoreMagic infrastructure. And then there's also a, a, a savings potential with the subscription pricing from Citrix Cloud. You're moving your, your CapEx cost to OpEx. And then there's that reduced ongoing maintenance. And the StoreMagic solution with that hardware flexibility, which I, I think is a huge benefit, um, you know, using commodity hardware and no need for SAN, um, there really is a huge cost savings there. So now, Lee, I'll kick it back off to you. Okay, hey man, that looks just like my simple secure. In fact, you've got all the same bullets there. So Citrix Cloud is giving you exactly the same benefits as Storm Magic. There must be some synergy there. Well, it's an important pillar, right? You know, the, <laughs> these things are important to a lot of businesses out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let's take a little look at the overall architecture of, of how all this solution actually works together. So what I'm going to do is just give you a little whiteboard example of um, how you would deploy this. And this really reflects the system that we have in the Lenovo Innovations Lab, actually. So uh, it, uh, it'll give you a, an overall view of what you need to get this up and running. So the first thing you need clearly is some infrastructure. Okay, so in this particular case, you have a DNS and DHCP server. Um, that will typically be in your branch office or it'll be you know, in your small data center. You also need Active Directory. So if you're in a branch office environment, you'd have some sort of replica at the AD level there that we can authenticate to. Um, and depending on your hypervisor, you would have System Center VMM to, to manage your um, Hyper-V infrastructure or vCenter to manage your um, ESX infrastructure. Okay, so they're the three components really that you need before you even start in embarking on your, your desktop journey. Now, of course, the next thing you're going to need is a couple of servers. So here are a couple of servers. Um, as we said, we run on Hyper-V or vSphere. Uh, this would be your hypervisor, Node 1 and Node 2. And if it's a, if it's a, a vSphere implementation, it will be set up as a cluster and vSphere level. Um, or another thing, if, it, if you're actually running it in a, in a VMware, sorry, in a Hyper-V environment, you'd probably set up a failover cluster up at the Microsoft level. And you can actually host the quorum disk for that Microsoft cluster on SVSAN as well. Okay, so not the quorum disk for SVSAN, but the quorum disk for Microsoft cluster. That can also be on SVSAN, if that makes any sense to you. Then, of course, you have the SVSAN super magic running underneath here so you've got um you've got your svsan cluster in this particular example here we've got um, a ram cache so we've added some extra memory to our svsan virtual appliances and we're actually allowing probably about i'd say about 30 gig ram so cache 30, 32 gig is a maximum but again yeah. with those sort of active active reads going on you're actually potentially reading from both so that's actually doubling up 32 gig per node is okay. giving you then 64 gig cool 
But I mean, those, those are upper limits as well. Do bear that in yeah. mind. An awful lot of our customers actually utilize much less than that. Mm, sure. So sure. sort of eight gig, 16 gig, something like that. Yeah. And of course, one gig is the minimum if you're not, not really using cash. Um, SSD cache. So in this particular solution, we've got an SSD cache, which is you know the next the next caching level down from from the fast RAM cache. And of course, we've saved ourselves a lot of money here by making the main data store um, for our virtual machines based on spinning media. Okay, just standard um, you know commodity commodity disks in there. So you've got your hypervisor set up. Now, of course, one other thing that's important is your SVSAN quorum service or a neutral storage host. Now, that will typically sit in your data center, as we said. Um, you can actually run it on, on a server in a branch office. It's no problem. Just You can choose whichever one you want, but you can run it centrally with up to a 1,000 clusters being managed by that single entity. Okay, So that's your kind of basic back-end infrastructure. So now we let's take a little look at the Citrix Cloud infrastructure. So we'll see here, you know, what you do is you set up your Citrix Cloud subscription, you subscribe to the virtual apps and desktop service, and you've now got the ability to have all of that hosted and managed by Citrix. So you have a number of elements sitting there. You've got the broker and security layer. So you've got your delivery controller, just the same way as you would do if you're running an on-premise version of, of Citrix Zen App or Citrix Zen Desktop. Um, you have a backend database to hold all of that information and you have a license server to check in and check out licenses of people are logging in and out. So all that is, is hosted in Citrix Cloud. At the management layer, you actually have um, the standard tools that you, you're probably used to if you ever run Citrix environment. Citrix Studio to create resource um, catalogs, machine catalogs and, res and resource groups and, and director for your day-to-day -day administration of that overall system. Okay, to, to monitor usage, monitor super utilization, connection counts, and do some, some basic stuff in there. It's all exactly the same in a Citrix Cloud world. And then, of course, you have your user access layer. So this is how your users get access to the system. So they will go in via Citrix Gateway, formerly known as a NetScaler Gateway. Um, there is a service running in Citrix Cloud that you can connect to and allow your users really, really simply to, to basically work from anywhere just by ticking a box in Citrix Cloud. And of course, you have your, your storefront, which is your single pane of glass so that your users log into. Obviously, that's now we're now seeing that superseded by a Workspace app um, as well. Um, but for the sake of argument, well, let's just call it storefront in, in this diagram here. But it's, it's now obviously a Citrix Workspace. So as you can see here, there's two different ways of uh, two different parts of this infrastructure, two discrete parts. One of them is managed by Citrix. So everything above this line here is actually running um, in Citrix's data center or in Citrix's um, Azure subscription, shall I say, um, either in the US or it's running in the in, in the EMEA um, Azure zones uh, that we now have, have, have two different uh, places that you can host your infrastructure within Citrix Cloud. But all of this is maintained by Citrix, it's managed by Citrix, and more importantly, it's patched and upgraded by Citrix. So every two to three weeks, Citrix will upgrade the system. So if you're a customer, there's very little you need to do to make sure that you're on the latest version, the latest feature set, and the latest functionality of Citrix. Okay, All of that back-end stuff is done for you by Citrix at the back-end. So all that operational time saved, effectively. Exactly. So you're not managing this infrastructure and all these servers on site, you know, which is one big headache if you're trying to do this on 20 or 30 different locations. Right? All of that is managed centrally for you by Citrix. Now, next question is, well, you know, you've got all this stuff over here. How, does, how do the two connect to each other? Well, the way you do it is via some elements called Citrix Cloud Connectors. So these Citrix Cloud Connectors sit basically on Windows servers in your infrastructure. Um, I've put them kind of on the line of manage there because the operating system is, is actually for the cloud connector is managed by you because it's running on your hypervisor in your data center. But the Citrix cloud software itself is actually managed by Citrix. And the reason they ask you to always have two is so they can basically recycle, you know, recycle, re upgrade um, that Citrix Cloud Connector. They only upgrade one on a resource location at a time to make sure you don't have any system downtime. Um, these Cloud Connectors can kind of act as pseudo brokers as well with local host cache. I know that local host cache is coming back soon. So that if you then have this connection missing, okay, so if say the internet connection goes down to your branch office, 
we can still actually have a local broker, albeit um, you know, a backup of the broker, if you like, with local host cache to allow you to still get access to your desktops. Um, obviously, another thing you can do, you can put storefront locally as well. That gives you the full resilience. So not only can users get into storefront and see their applications and desktops, but when they click on that icon to log in, the cloud connector can actually take over for Citrix Cloud and give you that level of resilience. Okay, so you've got resilience at the hypervisor level, you've got resilience at the cloud level. And I know that local host cache um, isn't quite implemented yet. I believe it's going to be soon though. Okay, so that's uh, something to be aware of. So once you've got all of this set up with your cloud connectors, the next thing you can do is just use machine creation services to just run your VDAs or your workers or your virtual desktops. And they run directly on top of the SVSAN infrastructure. So that's where all the virtual machines are. They're all up and running. And the way users connect into them is typically just by going to that Citrix gateway. They, the user will go from their device at home or you know, Starbucks or wherever they happen to be. Um, they'll log into the NetScaler gateway or the Citrix gateway. That will authenticate them through the cloud connector to Active Directory. Um, it'll then talk to the delivery controller and give them all their applications and, and, uh, and, and desktops. They'll click on it. When they click on their desktop, they'll then get routed through the Citrix cloud connector to that virtual desktop. So there's no additional firewall and funny stuff that you need to do to get access to that desktop. All of it is dealt with by Citrix cloud connector. And Citrix cloud connector uses standard protocols to, and standard port numbers so that you don't have to do any reconfiguration on your, on your firewall. Just use a standard HTTPS type of communication. In fact, when you install the cloud connector, it does a connectivity test to make sure you have the right ports active across your firewall. So that's that's basically the infrastructure, guys. You know, you've got the back end um, SVSAN infrastructure here. Um, you've got all of your standard Microsoft uh, and VMware management stuff, uh, tools. You've got Citrix Cloud, the control plane, managed by Citrix, monitored by Citrix and, and upgraded by Citrix. And you've got Citrix Cloud Connector dealing with your, your the connectivity between your remote branch office and Citrix Cloud, and giving you that great performance and that great manageability. So what I want to do now is go across on to show you how easy it is to set up Store Magic to talk to Citrix Cloud. And we've developed a little wizard to allow you to get up and running really quickly. Just before we do that, I just wanted to talk to you, Mark, and just say, has there been any good questions coming in you want to share with the audience? Still? Well, so I've tried to answer, uh, opening them up to everybody. So do please take a look because there's some really great questions uh, coming in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what, one of the questions I see there, actually, um, Mark, is, uh, is is Store Magic um, just a Citrix solution? So is the Store Magic proposition just a Citrix one? Well, so all of our sort of value proposition that you're here, seeing here is about that lean hardware infrastructure, being able to make these kind of virtualized environments accessible and, and consumable. And, and we very much tried to do that for a Citrix workload, as we're showing here, but no. It's not just limited to Citrix. This can absolutely be utilized for other infrastructure services as well. Um, there, there's a really nice use case that we'll reference later on, as you, you mentioned about a server-based SAN, something I would describe as, as a hybrid converged, where they effectively have some of that infrastructure services, delivery controller type piece as running as hyper-converged on those storage nodes, but then you know some external compute nodes uh, hosting these desktops as well. Okay, okay. So, so uh, by the way, let's just go back to that whiteboard. I can show you how this works, actually, because one of the questions that, that's also I've noticed is, does it run on Zen Server or Citrix Hypervisor, as it's called? Now, we've mentioned Hyper-V and we've mentioned ESX, but we haven't mentioned Zen Server. Guess what? What you would do in that sort of scenario where you want your virtual desktops running on Zen Server is effectively all you do is you use SVSAN just as a standard SAN rather than launching workloads on it. So you would use it as a storage only SAN, so you would have your Hyper-V or VMware cluster sitting here, all of the disks the same way as you had before, but you would just talk via, so let's, let's say this is Zen server. Okay, I'm actually gonna modify this slide. Sorry, I'll never call it Citrix Hypervisor, by the way. I'm an old Zen server guy, I used to work for Zen source. I'll always call it Zen server, so apologies for that. <laughs> but you can launch your virtualization, your, your VDAs on, on Zen server but then just use store magic as a SAN if you want to. And of course, you know, with this SV SAN solution, you can create multiple clusters as well of SV SAN nodes, and you can have them all in the same VMware cluster or the same SCVMM cluster. So although you'll have two storage repositories at the end of the day in your cluster, 
your virtual machines would be able to be live migrated across, providing you move the storage over with them as well. So there's various different scale out options. You can add additional two node clusters, or you could just treat the SVSAN as a standard iSCSI target. Okay, anything? Uh, yeah, there's one other question I'm seeing here, which is which is quite a good one. It's it's, it's I'm talking about faults. So what if what if one of these spindle disks or one of these SSDs went down? Well, so where SVSAN typically runs in a two node environment, what we actually utilize is internal RAID within those hosts, first and foremost. So we're actually building in some hardware resiliency. But there is actually a, a common scenario, if I say common, you, you still have that RAID controller present within that system. So actually, if, if that experience is a fault, or if you have multiple disks fail within a system, what we're saying about these commodity servers, we, we have had customers that have had multiple disks fail in, in some pretty harsh environments. I mean, you know, we're, we're out there in deserts for, for energy and oil companies, things like that. Mm -hmm. So in the event of a multiple disk failure within one of those nodes, actually, there's a level of protection within SVSAN as well. OK, so if we see IOs timing out or, or failing to that underlying storage, we actually mark that side of the mirror as storage failed. And now those IOs just simply get proxied across to the other side in the mirror. Okay. So you have that internal resiliency and that cross node resiliency. But actually, you know, should one of those nodes fail or you have a critical storage failure within one of those systems, you're still protected. Now, Lee, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the typical cost of these environments, 50 percent or so was a physical yeah, sand. Yeah, so, exactly. you know, that single point of failure, you can build a lot of resiliency into there. But should it go, it's still a restore from backup scenario. With SVSAN, should that node completely fail, that critical storage failure scenario, actually you have a complete true copy of that data on right. your other system, right. and it, it's simply an IO proxy across, you know, so very powerful. Do you know what was really scary? Um, when, we, when we started setting up this webinar, we had all of our SVSAN storage already allocated for my virtual machines. And I said, well, look, I want to create one as a demo. How can I, can we, can we shrink the data store? And Mark said, well, you can't shrink it once it's grown. You can grow it dynamically, but you can't shrink it dynamically because obviously data could be anywhere on the disk, right? But what I can do is I can just break the mirror. I can delete it on one side. I can then create a smaller um, data store on there, and then we'll have some spare space to use for your demo. How does that sound? I said, yeah, okay, let's do it. So we, we started doing it, and I said, hey, hang on. Are we gonna, do you want me to turn all my VMs off first before we do this? And Mark said, no, you don't need to turn anything off. We're just breaking one side of the mirror. We're doing the modification and we'll synchronize it back. And we'll deal, you know, there was no downtime at all. Some major change like that. And there was no downtime. You know, you can upgrade these appliances without any downtime. You just go to the SVSAN GUI and, and actually apply your patches there. Or so any it. component within that system from, from firmware on that hardware, a memory upgrade, yeah. for example, you can down one node. Anything you want to do to that system, you can just do it as a staggered approach between those two nodes. Brilliant. All live in production hours. Okay, so let's let's get on to the next part of our demo then. So we've we've shown you how to create an SVSAN um, um, target in here. As you can see, you know we we had uh, various different options within here as well. If we go to uh, where was it here, you know we were talking about the ability to to actually upgrade the the the, the network. If we go to configure. Here's our plugin. We can actually come in here to the dashboard. We can deploy a VSA onto the server. You can deploy it to multiple server hosts, deploy the, the a neutral storage host or quorum disk from within here. Uh, we can even come in here and there's an upgrade option if we want to upgrade our SVSAN. And all of this can be done centrally from a data center. Okay, uh, Very, very easy to do. So everything's healthy in here. Everything's running. Um, so what I want to do now is show you how to connect this system into the um, into the Citrus Cloud, and to do that, I'm going to create a connector. Okay, so I've uh, deployed a Windows uh, 2016 server here. It's domain joined. It's got all the latest patches on it. I think it needed .NET or something as well, but whatever. It, it's ready to be a connector at this particular point. Um, all I need to do is run the Store Magic GUI. So the Store Magic GUI is going to run in here and allow us to um, to actually connect into Citrix Cloud and automatically install this. So, you know, it's really, really easy. So what first thing you need to do is put your Store Magic um, or your Citrix Cloud API credentials in here. So we're called Store Magic. OK, I've got to put my customer ID. This is where I do a very quick cut and paste. OK. 
So this is a live demo, so uh, don't don't note down that customer ID, guys. That's uh, that's that's for your eyes only. So it's, you it's nice and friendly, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, nice, nice and friendly. <laughs> okay, let's get our secret key. This is not going to show you that, which is nice, and it's now going to verify the connection to Citrix Cloud to make sure that you can get to the cloud and uh, deploy that that really really quickly. So now we need to do is just uh, tell it what our host is. So in this particular case, our host is um, CC Connector dot store magic dot test that's just its uh, microsoft name um, the username in this particular case i'm just going to log into the store magic domain as administrator okay and password okay i'm just going to type that again i've got a feeling i might have pressed two keys there in my in my have you got fat fingers Lee? yeah okay and verify connection OK, now the cool thing is what it's going to do is it's going to show us we've got some existing resource locations in Citrix Cloud already. So, you know, for instance, if we go back to Citrix Cloud now, so if we go back to uh, where are we? Citrix Cloud, what you'll see here is we've got a couple of resource locations. Just needs to re-authenticate there because timed out. We'll see we've got a couple of resource locations running already because, of course, we have um, a live demo running in the background. But you'll see here how simple it is to add another resource location to Citrix Cloud using this wizard. So two resource locations. Let's have a quick look in there and see what they're called. There's one that's offline at the moment. That's our, our Cisco um, test rig that isn't, isn't on at the moment. So we've got our Lenovo IBM. Um, stuff as you can see you know two Citrix cloud connectors running on my two servers there and that's it so far so let's let's go ahead and, and create a new resource location so instead of using an existing resource location what I'll do is create a new one and we'll just call this webinar RL webinar resource location okay for, for the sake of argument and hit install and all this is going to do now if I hit continue is it's just going to go ahead and do all the, the process for you. It's going to go to Citrix Cloud. It's going to download the latest connector code that it finds. Um, it's going to verify if, if all the prerequisites are there. It's going to set it up. Um, you'll also notice that we go into um, server management here. You'll notice there's no Citrix components loaded on this server at this particular moment in time. Um, but very shortly, you'll see some Citrix stuff appearing in here. Um, it's going to create the resource location in Citrix Cloud for us. If we go back in here and hit refresh all, you'll actually see it's it's created a resource location. Probably takes about four to five minutes to go through the overall process. In in a few seconds time, you'll see that, that this is actually going to be done for you. Now, this wizard at the end of the day is, is installing Citrix um, connector for you. There, there isn't any store magic code in the connector as such. It's giving you the ability to very quickly and very simply get up and running. OK, so just in case, just for the sake of argument, it's not modifying the Citrix connector in any way. So if Citrix makes any changes to Citrix connector, OK, which it does, you know, every every two or three weeks, then that's not going to break anything because we always go and get the latest version of that connector uh, and deploy it. If you have a quick look, you just hit refresh in here very shortly. And of course, it does take a few minutes. You'll actually see some um, Citrix stuff going in here. Um, various different things in Citrix Connector, actually. Um, there's lots of things. So there's a brokering element to it. There's an element that looks after connectivity into Active Directory. There's the gateway services that allow you to uh, connect in via the connector to your virtual desktops from anywhere in the world. Um, there are things like a backup data store as well. So there's a backup store that um, your Citrix uh, information about delivery groups and resource locations, that kind of thing, um, gets backed up to. So if there's a failure and the Citrix cloud goes down and you lose an internet connection or whatever, um, it'll be up and running even, even though your, your connection is down because it's effectively it'll implement something called local host cache, which makes that that resource location uh, connector look like a look like a broker. Okay, okay, we're we're still in the background there. It, it's, it does run. It takes about five minutes to run, but you know, in terms of what you have to do from a user's perspective, it's actually really, really, uh, it's not very much at all. Maybe we'll go back to that um, as we go through. But you'll see here in Citrix Cloud, 
um, it's now created the resource location in a few seconds. Um, you'll actually see a, there we go, there's a new cloud connector in there. So it, it takes a while to do its connectivity checks and all of that kind of nice stuff. Um, once that's happened though, you'll see, there we go, there's some Citrix cloud services. There's a few more that appear as time goes by as well. So that's how easy it is to implement into Citrix Cloud. But as I mentioned, we've actually got a system running here already. Okay, so we've actually got um, a system running in Citrix Cloud. So if I go back into, into here and uh, click on my services, go to virtual apps and desktops, you'll actually see that the Lenovo systems are already connected in and running. Okay. Um, it's also connected into the back-end hypervisors as well. So if you go to the host section within the um, studio tool, you'll actually see that we're connected to the hypervisor within that. And with the combination of Citrix Cloud Connector and the hypervisor connector, we can actually create and manage and deliver virtual desktops across onto, onto that hypervisor. In this particular case, it's just using the standard VMware connectivity to actually do that. And what we've done is we've just managed and, and deployed out a load of uh, Citrix Zen app servers here onto this infrastructure. Okay. Uh, we've also got uh, about 200 virtual desktops as well. As you can see at the moment, we've got our six, um, sorry, eight Zen app servers running across these two nodes. And uh, if I actually go across and hit refresh here, you'll actually see there's a whole bunch of sessions running on here as well. Okay. There's our, our session count for each of these. We can go in and monitor these. So you can see here, we're, we're right up here. We've got 230 sessions running on here. Um, if we go back into the, um, the thing here, you'll see we're actually running login VSI and we're actually getting towards VSI Max here. Okay, so you can see our two hosts in vSphere are actually giving us some CPU errors now because we're, we're running really heavy workloads uh, on these servers now. And um, let's just go into the monitor there you'll actually see that CPU utilization is, is going up quite a lot. Um, we're right near the end of our test run now. Obviously, you know, as time has gone by, we've actually ramped up the, the use and, and launched more and more sessions across these hosts uh, just to see what the, the maximum is without us getting any, uh, uh, any user experience degradation. So let's go have a quick look. Login VSI, you can see it's running there. We're nearly coming to the end of our login VSI test. You can see it's starting to strain a bit because we've lost um, lost a, a session. That typically starts to happen in login VSI um, when, when the system's under a lot of load. But if you look at what's happening here, all of these launches are actually just running Citrix workloads. Okay, So it's running Word, it's running um, Excel, it's doing calculations, it's doing CPU intensive stuff such as zip file um, creation, um, it's, it's printing PDFs, it's doing all this stuff for you. And this workload we're running at the moment and all the testing we did was on the office worker workload. So not the, the knowledge worker one, which is the lowest level down. Um, it was the next level up from that. Okay, So all of this low testing that we've done has been based on that. So you can see here, um, all of this is, is running quite nicely and uh, everything's, everything's looking good. Now let's have a little look at what's, what's happening from an SV SAND perspective, because this is a really important part, right? We can see that the, the, the CPU is starting to strain under the load here, but how's the storage performing? So let's have a little look, shall we, Mark? See what's what's going on. Here. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, where we're saying that these CPUs are, are straining, you know, th this is a very small environment. You know, this hmm. is servicing 230 plus sessions yeah. that I see on, on a little two node cluster with, I, I think we said dual socket eight core systems in these. Yeah, I think it's about 16 in total. So, so this, this is a, a low cost of entry point, you know, accessible uh, workspace appliance. Yeah, do you know what? We actually ran the, the bill of materials for this, didn't we? And the server hardware itself was around 15,000, by the time you've got discount, about $15,000. That's for the for two that servers, pair. exactly. two servers and the SSDs and the spindle disks. Exactly. That. Under $20,000. And, you, you know, you add on that, obviously you need to add on that the SV SAN cost, for a base license, we're talking about what, about $5,000? Uh, so our, our two terabyte advanced, yeah, is actually around about 4,000 US, I believe. Yeah. I mean, again, don't quote those figures. We're, we're not on the sales team here, guys, but you know, it should absolutely be, you know, that, yeah. that affordable, accessible but price. For the point. price of a small family car, <laughs> you're hosting over 200 desktops on here for your, on your infrastructure, right? So that, obviously you're on top of that, you've got to add 
subsidiaries, cloud licenses. We're just talking about the hardware and the storage there, the hyper-converged elements of this. Well, it's okay. certainly a, a lot better than that 321 physical sand type architecture. Yeah, exactly, it? exactly. So as you can see here, this, this is the, the mirror that we're running on. If you look at the caching that's happening here, you'll see that, look at this, 85% of the reads that those desktops have been generating is actually coming out of memory cache, not even going anywhere near a disk. Right, so that means that our user desktops are getting some awesome performance. Um, some of it is going to SSD cache, 14% in there. Only 1% of anything is actually going to spindle this to be read. Right, I, I think that's just amazing, frankly. You, you think you think of how much money you can save it just by putting spindle disks in instead of having to have a full flash array. Oh, exactly, you know, those enterprise drives can get very, very expensive. Yeah, and uh, let's have a little look at the, the statistics at a little bit more in depth level. Um, so this is the last day's worth of use. Let's just have a look at the last um, hour or so since I started running this test. Let's go in here. I think this spike here at uh, three three thousand eight hundred IOPS was when I booted the servers for Zenapp hosts. Okay. Apart from that, though, you can see very very little IOP traffic is going in there. Okay. So that means that really the storage, even though the CPUs are becoming a bottleneck on these hosts, that you know they're they're, they're, they just they just are. Um, the storage isn't straining in any way. If you look at the throughput, you'll actually see here the amount of throughput for these tests. What are we talking? That that's pretty low, right? Yeah, no, that's not stressing the the storage too much at all. Uh, but but that's because it's coming out of those flash tiers. I mean, yeah. you know that memory, those SSDs, giving you those low latency, you know, high random I/O performance that we're going to be looking for. And also we have uh, the latency figures here as well. So look, uh, the highest latency we're seeing here is about 5, 5.3 milliseconds. Uh, what, what's the maximum you expect before before the starts to Things start suck? to feel a little bit suck. Uh, <laughs> things start to feel a little bit sluggish around 30 milliseconds. Okay, so, so five, five and a half milliseconds is nothing. Okay, Absolutely. so in, all, in the whole of this scenario. At, at a peak workflow, bear that in mind as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, right, so one final thing I just wanted to show you before moving on and, uh, and uh, move through to the next section is basically uh, some of the login VSI testing that I've been doing. So you can see this is a login VSI stuff that's running in here. If I go through to, to my login VSI VM though, you'll actually see some of the analyses that I've been doing. So I've been testing on this, this system, this 20, 20 grand system, a couple of things. One is ZenApp, so ZenApp 25 gig, Per, per worker, eight vCPUs per worker, and a 250 user test. Okay, both of, all of these images were optimized using the Microsoft, sorry, the, the VMware OSOT tool, and the Citrix one, by the way, and uh, using the Office Worker. And what we see here is we can run 233 ZenApp sessions on this configuration. This was actually the Hyper-V test that we did, uh, rather than the VMware one. VSI Max, you can see there, 233, so 233 out of 250. That's where performance started to suffer, okay, on this particular workload. We also ran it for um, Windows 10, so running a standard Windows 10, again, optimized with, with VMware's OSOT tool. Um, and we managed to get 188 out of 200. So 200 is, is actually the, the maximum you can get on these hosts and before you run out of memory, right, because it's only got 200 gig of, of 200 gig? Yeah, 200 gig of usable host, of usable RAM per node. So if each VM's got two gig, that's 200 VMs maximum before we run out. So the CPU started to, started to strain under the load just before we reached that, that, that physical maximum of, you know, you've run out of memory. So as you can see, you know, that's, that's a lot of compute. For such a small package. Absolutely, and, and there's nothing to say that those hardware platforms can't be scaled. You know, there's no reason that they can't have higher core count CPUs and more memory uh, within them as well. So yeah, exactly. That, and really, because it's just uh, it's, it's, the restriction is really on number of cores. You can actually increase the number of cores and theoretically get a lot more VMs on there. By the way, that that failed server OS you can see there. I I, I hate that. I tried to get rid of this message. I couldn't get rid of it. It's actually on another system that isn't running. <laughs> So it's actually failed, but it's because the server's turned off. That, okay. that, that would do it. Look, it's on a on a completely different uh, on a completely different thing there. So don't think that's uh, part of the test. That's just uh, uh, something a hangover from a previous set of testing we did. So brilliant. So that's uh, the demonstrations um, finished with. Let's just move on and talk a little bit about 
who's using SB SAN today. So as you can see, we've got loads of customers worldwide, um, some really big customers in there, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely. So, I mean, there's a huge variety of different use cases here. I mean, and here in the UK, uh, the NHS, absolutely huge organization, hopefully fairly well known, uh, uses in a bunch of their uh, different office locations. These are actually education centers around UK sort of training platforms. But the I know one the I NHS. Know I actually was, was a customer of theirs yesterday when my foot swell, swelled up due to a, a wasp sting. Well, so I'm, if you I'm offend well. some wasps, you deserve everything <laughs> you get. Uh, the one that I referenced earlier, however, is actually a, a US organization called Drive Shack. Now, I, we don't even have their logo yet on the uh, on, on this slide. This is a fairly recent addition, uh, but this is running that sort of hybrid converged architecture that I mentioned earlier. I, I really like this versus some of the other hyper converged type vendors that are out there, because with SVSAM, what we do is just license the capacity on those systems. So where I mentioned that sort of hybrid converged model, where they have their infrastructure machines on those sort of server storage compute nodes all together, and those external compute only nodes, they simply share the storage out with no additional licensing cost or no additional complications with that regard. So they have all those external compute systems with their own video graphics cards in them, doing that, that sort of powerful VDI graphics processing in them, but at a much more cost-effective consumable price point. Now, that is the first, and there are a further 25 of these to go live. So there is just no way they'd have been able to, to do that virtualization project against that many locations had it been more complicated, more complex, and, and sure, more costly. Sure. And I know a couple of a couple of guys we can pick out in here. Epic, they're actually using this to host virtual desktops, right, as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so they're healthcare running, provider. Yeah, healthcare provider. Um, most of you have probably heard of that. Um, alternative solutions, they're also a service provider that's actually running and hosting virtual desktops as well. Again, so uh, that's, that's a Hyper-V customer, and they use that server-based SAN model as well that we mentioned earlier. Okay, okay, and you can see some some pretty big logos in here, um, Argos, Home Depot, etc. Oh, they Depot. don't matter, Nobody, nobody's noted them. Oh yeah, no, you, got, <laughs> you have to make it American, got to be done. That's true. So, that's kind of some people that are using the, the solution. Now, Store Magic has been around for a number of years now, and we've built a really big network of resellers and partners out there. So if you're a partner, if you're a Citrix partner at the moment, and you're interested in going to market with us to, to sell store magic underneath some of your um, small business or, or edge um, branch office solutions to your to your end users and to your customers, then you know reach out to us. We'd, we'd love for you to come on board and become a preferred partner of, of store magic and you know, Look at the uh, just go to the URL at the top there, and uh, we'll be more than happy to engage with you. Um, obviously, we have some some um, a lot of hardware partners as well. In terms of you know, we've got a reference architecture coming out. We've actually got version one out, but there's going to be version two out soon with Cisco. Um, we're we're partners with with Dell EMC, uh, Lenovo, as you know from our use of the, uh, the the lab over there, and of course, last but not the least. Citrix ready, so we've got a great partnership here with uh, with Citrix as well. Now, um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm writing some reference architectures at the moment that mirror all of these this testing that I've been doing. So, I just wanted to show you just a quick preview, sneak peek of my reference architecture. There you go. As you can see, it's reference architecture version 1.2, whatever. Um, so it's not quite released yet, but this goes through the whole thing, right? So it goes through, you know, why you would want to do this, you know, what a who is it applicable to? What are the what are the issues this is solving? Compliance and security, etc. All the stuff we've been talking about today. It goes through all the various components, like the the hypervisor layer, the um, storage and and uh, and and hardware layer. It goes through the architectural overview I showed you, and you know most importantly, right at the end here, it shows you all of the performance tests that we did. Okay, so if I just scroll down a little bit there's the benchmarking and uh, this is going to be going up on our website shortly um, it's also going to be going up hopefully on the login vsi website as well so you can download it from there but there's the login vsi here here's all the testing sorry if there's some latency on your screen by the way and i'm just flicking through this just to give you a rough idea uh, but yeah so you know look out for that will be coming very very soon okay so chris um Thanks very much for, for giving us the platform so far. I know that you've got a few bits of summary that you want to, to give to, uh, uh, to us before we, we, we move to the final part of this webinar, which is a competition, of course, where you can actually win a drone. Okay, so Chris, sure. are you there? Yep, 
Yeah, yeah thanks, Lee. That, that was a, a fantastic uh, demo and, you know, very brave to do live demos on, on a live webinar like this. So there's a uh, there's a few reasons why I really like the Score Magic solutions. You can go ahead and build out that slide. Um, and you, you kind of covered this a little bit earlier. You know, it's very simple and easy to get up and running very quickly. It, it ships um, Citrix Cloud Ready. It's very cost effective since you only need the two nodes. And you have the flexibility to pick any x86 hardware. Um, it works with vSphere and Hyper-V and hopefully will work with Zen server soon. Um, but here, I, I want to tell a few stories of mistakes I've seen companies make with virtualization and with SANS in the past when I was in IT. Um, I, I saw a company uh, specifically going through a Zen app upgrade project, and they decided not to implement shared storage because SANs were too expensive. So they had just a bunch of standalone virtual hosts, and um, you know ultimately they regretted that decision down the line when those hosts started running out of storage. And you know StoreMagic would have been a perfect fit for this company's needs, and this was like a, a 2,000 uh, person company. Um, and I saw another um, a company purchase expensive flash-based storage for the database of their ERP system. And um, when when they uh, they purchased this hardware, they had a 90-day trial. So the IT leadership they decided that the best way to test this was in production. So I bet you know how that went. And you know, long story short, they didn't luckily uh, didn't lose any data, but their ERP system uh, was down for a, a full day. So. What I really like about the StoreMagic solution is, you know, we in IT, we like to do POCs, but with a lot of these HDI vendors, those POCs are, are expensive when that software is bound to the hardware. So with, with StoreMagic, with that any x86 hardware flexibility, it makes it really easy to get up and running uh, with testing the solution in a, in a POC. And everybody in IT has spare servers laying around in, in their labs. So, I mean, you can get up and running testing this solution today, right? So that's one of the things I, I really love about the, the Store Magic solution. Awesome, Chris. That That is great. Thanks very much for the summary. Now, I know you guys are looking to, uh, we're running slightly over. Do apologize for that. But just before we go, we have a little competition for you. Now, the way you're going to win this competition, guys, is by using the questions pane that is in front of you. OK, so the same place you've been going to answer your question, ask your questions. And what I want you to do is I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. And the first person to get the right word answer to the question will actually win this drone. OK, so go to the questions window right now. And uh, by the way, if you're a Storm Magic person and you're on here, you're not eligible. If you're a Citrix person, you're not eligible. I'm, we I'm have had Citrix really, people. I, I winning have the, a go. Yeah, you can't. Oh. Sorry. It's not. So you have to be a customer or a partner. Okay, so the question is, what is the name of the Store Magic product that enables low-cost hyper-converged systems? And if you'd like to go there now, and you can see a few people have, have come on already. Um, okay, thanks very much, guys. You, you, actually, they're all getting it right. They are That's really right. good. Well done. Now, obviously, some people are listening. So very impressive there. So, OK, you can stop now. Um, we've actually got um, got a winner. Now, first people that, that were nearly there, we've got uh, Abraham S, S uh, who got the answer right. It was SV San, of course, is the word we were looking for. Um, that was very good. Um, so Abraham S uh, was nearly there. We've got Johnny, jo Johnny J, um, who nearly got it right as well. So you just were pipped to the post there by previous user. So, yes, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, you look like you wanted to say something there. So, all right. So, right. Okay. So we've had a little conference in the background. The the the, the judges have had a little conference, and the, the person that's actually won the competition is a Lenovo person. So he doesn't count because he's a staff member, effectively. Um, instead of instead of a customer, so we're actually going to award this to the person who the next person down the list, which was Johnny J. Okay, so Johnny J, you did really well, and you are now the winner. Okay, so um, if you would just uh, like to coordinate, you know, we've got your email address from uh, from Citrix, or we'll we hopefully get your email address from Citrix. If you give us your address and respond to that email, we'll get that drone sent to you. So well done, Johnny J. Thanks very much. 
Okay, guys. So uh, that's that's basically that's basically a wrap. I just wanted to share with you before we go. Here are some places to go for further information on this. You can get a, a POC of this stuff up really, really quickly, right? You can get a couple of standard pieces of hardware, stick VMware or Hyper-V on them, uh, download a trial edition, and uh, get up and running on this really, really quickly. So. If you want to look at some good um, YouTube videos that tell you how to install all this step by step, there's a couple of great ones there, one for Hyper-V and one for ESX. There's all sorts of deployment videos. Obviously, there's the Citrix website as well uh, for, for news about the Citrix Ready program. You can go here for the evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go through all of this. It's all pretty self-explanatory if you go to our website. And of course, there's that Lenovo Innovation Center as well. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to contact us and talk to us more about this solution, um, just email this address. So we, we've, uh, we have an alias, citrix at storemagic.com. Okay, so if you want to talk about this with us further, uh, please, please engage with us at this level. So, so really, all, all it remains for, for me and Mark to say, at least, from our perspective, is thank you very much for listening, guys. It's been great. And we're going to hand it back over to Rubel now, who's now going to uh, finish off the, the webinar. So Rubel, are you with us? I am, and thank you so much, Lee, for a wonderful webinar. I think it was very insightful uh, for me, and I'm sure audience will agree for me. Uh, so once again, thanks, Lee. It was great, and thanks, uh, Chris, to you for bringing in the Citrix uh, set of the story and uh, you know giving us some insights. And Mark, uh, a job very well done in Q&A, answering all the questions online. So appreciate all the effort that you guys have put together for our audience. Uh, so thanks again. Last but not the least, uh, let me thank the audience, ladies and gentlemen. You've been wonderful. Thanks a lot for taking the time out uh, and listening to our webinar today. Uh, so Lee, let me flip it back to you for any last words. Speak now or forever hold your peace. Yeah, sure. So so of course, the this has been recorded. Um, you will get a link to the recording later on. It'll also go on YouTube. Um, we'll have a we'll host it. And but, you know, to be honest, it's going to go into the Citrix channel. Um, I suggest. Also, I'm going to put the slide deck onto SlideShare, so we'll try and share that URL with you in the follow-up email as well. Okay. And of course, you know, go to Citrix Ready or go to Citrix at StoreMagic.com if you want to engage with us further. But you know, thank you very much, Rubel, for having us today. We really enjoyed presenting. And uh, back to you for for your final wrap up. Final, final wrap up. <laughs> Likewise. Thanks again. That's all I have to say. And this concludes the webinar. Have a good day, guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys.